Good afternoon all together. I have a question to you. It's hard for me to grasp the audience because uh, they are so widespread. But would you mind raising your hands? Who is actively writing automated tests to his code on a regular basis? Who is not yet doing so? OK, next year I expect all of you who raise their hand the second time that you do that, maybe next week. So that's my intention. Who has been in the talk that was in this room just before? Who not? OK, 50-50 roughly. My concern is about software quality. And I think, see, I also have an animal. It's an elephant in the room. Nobody acknowledges that quality is bad, but software quality is bad. And I've seen interesting examples, especially in the talk uh, by Kate uh, uh, and her colleague, I forgot his name, about things that happen in real code. I've seen worse but I hope to make it a better situation. The problem is, especially with quality and testing, it's always hope, or you put your head in the sand, or ignore what's going on, especially manual testing. Who is doing manual testing of his own or her own code? I want to have the num the next year I want the number zero on that. Manual testing is only useful for HCI, so to see if the human can actually use a system. Manual testing by a programmer is, after debugging, the worst means to spend your time. Because it's unrepeatable and a time waste. Thank you. And I need a pen. Okay. The problem is, bad things start small, and can easily become big problems. Now, when I went to university, I had the things like, OK, it compiles. I felt the greatest guy in the world after my first program actually compiled. It runs. What does that mean? It can be started. It doesn't crash immediately after useful input. It runs even with random input. That meant the cat, jumped on the, the cat jumped on the keyboard. Actually, that was one of the tests in my first programming job, where we were developing DOS applications. You have to have to be able to hammer on the keyboard, and the program mustn't crash. Maybe there were some exceptions, like Alt, Control, Delete. But all the other keys shouldn't make the program crash. It creates the correct result. That's also something we are very happy about as freshmen. But that's not testing, and that's not giving you quality. The quality I want is where you have automated testing, because automated testing actually allows you to do all the changes you might have learned in the past hour that you should apply to your code, make them without being, having to worry that your code will no longer work after you made a change. Automated testing, regardless on what level, helps you to actually make your code simpler and better, and even further on. Now, how can we get automated tests? If you don't have automated tests, we get into a vicious uh, circle. You get stressed, because every change, you don't know if you would break something, because you have no guarantee telling you that you broke something. You still might, even with automated tests, you still might end up breaking things that you don't recognize, but that tells you then that your tests are not good enough. And because you have no time for tests, you don't write tests, you get less testing and more stress. And if you don't test, things like collapsing stuff happen. So those of you who haven't been in my talk uh, yesterday know what's wrong with Maine. Just for those who haven't been, you can rehearse that now. But the, bad, the worst thing about that piece of code is it's untestable. How would you test that 
the functionality that's core to that program is, is okay. Any ideas? Not many. One? Sorry, I can't hear. You have to either step to the microphone or really shout. Do a link time substitution of the C out function, and then you can put a mock in there. And then when you run main, you can kind of get in between the interaction between that main function and the third party library. Okay, that guy knows how to do it, but I'm not sure if everybody has got it, so I like to show you. And I, I'm a professor and I do actually live coding. I'm brave enough to do that, so. And let's see what we've got. This is our hello world. So the first refactoring we do, that is the easiest one you can always do, and we learned that, get rid of comments. Simpler. And we can actually check if that still runs. It does. Now, there's another comment to get rid of. It's also okay. Let's do like that. So, simpler, less screen space. Now, the, the key thing is now, to, we cannot test main. Because we cannot call main from within our program. So what we need to do is actually extract the core functionality in a separate function that we can later hope to test. So there is some refactoring required, and that's actually available. It's called extract function. Let's call it, say, hello. And now we call that function from main, and having that function is actually helping us to make our, let's see if it's still, so we do manual testing, you see, not very good. Now this function depends on a global variable. So maybe we should have done something first. That guy was talking about, okay, we should have something instead of C out that we use here. So what we can actually do is, and use that local variable. And if you look closely, we see that is an O stream. Actually, it's an O stream reference, so we call it like that. And now if we refactor, we will get that variable as a parameter to our extracted function. So instead of having a dependency on a global variable, we now have a parameter that we can substitute. And fortunately, the O stream or stream library actually is an object-oriented framework with inheritance where you have an abstraction, the O stream, with multiple instances and multiple subclasses we can use. And to actually test that piece of code, we need to put that into, uh, we can call it with, for example, a string stream, an O string stream, and then compare the output that goes to the string with what we expect what the output would be. Now we have another problem. We have a main function, and that main function cannot be the test function. So to first, to be able to test our function, we need to split it in a separate object file or best in a separate library so you can write a test program against it that has its own main function and will actually elaborate that say hello function. And to do so, I first get rid of that using namespace std. Let's see if it still compiles, looks so. And now I can also refactor that to a new header file. If you look closely, you see that we have a new header file say hello. 
Now, do I have to do something that is not, uh, I have to do some manual refactoring because I have to create now a library project that will take care of my, let's do a static library. Hello? Or actually move into that lib hello, our new header file. Now we need to change a little bit here to make it aware of that other header file. So we have lib hello. Before we continue, we have to clean up here again. There's strange code going on. This doesn't isn't a self-contained header. So we add the missing include statement. I should be able to do that automatically as well. But now what's bad with that function? Who can see what's bad with that? The function definition in header file. Pablo? It's not an inline function, the function body is in the header file. So there's two things we can do about that. One is to actually write inline in front of it. And the second thing is actually we can toggle the function definition. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's because it sees another project. Let's see if I can do it again. Cool. It worked yesterday. <laughs> and let's try the other way around. We have to tell the compiler where to find the include file. Yeah. To see that I didn't break anything. Okay, hello world is still running. Now we prepared everything to actually test our hello world function. Don't be afraid these red wiggly lines will go away. Now we have here a test hello. Let's compile that. That's using our unit testing framework. And you see we have here a test case. And the first test, if you want to, I run that as a queue test. Oh, I should have compiled it first. Oh, it looks for the library implementation. Why doesn't it do that? Okay, let's do it by hand.
file again. Not actually linked. Compile again. So, and we see we have a failing test case. Red bar. Now what do we do when we have a failing test case? We make it run. So we can cheat and return, uh, change that to true, but that wouldn't help us. So we actually want to test our hello. So what, what do we want to assert? We actually want to assert equality. So what is the expected output of hello world? Who knows that? Hello, comma, world on a new line. Is that what you would expect? Not really? That's what I, that's, I think that's the canonical hello world output. We should expect from our program. And we need to accept, expect it from something. So I already promised we need an O stream, O string stream, and ask it for its output. Get rid of that craft. Now we are missing that variable. Oh no, that's not what I wanted. And we want to say hello to that variable. Everything set? OK, compiles. Runs, and we have a failing test case. So why did this test case fail? Well, actually, the hello world that was auto-generated by Eclipse is not the canonical hello world. It gives us a different output. So now we have two means to, to uh, get that done. Either change the function because it's wrong, or change the assertion because our assertion is wrong. <coughs> so what was wrong? You have to decide. You're the designers. OK, let's change the implementation. The good thing is. With an IDE, you just control click. And now I see why it looks for two. Let's change the implementation. Let's see if we run. Yeah, but do, you don't have to tell me. The computer will tell me. OK, I misspelled world. It should be lowercase. No problem. OK. Fix it. Green bar. Okay, what have we learned from that? We now have a testable hello world. We can even run our, let's see if we can run our original hello world, if it still compiles, and we didn't break something. No, oh, that's the wrong program to run. Oh, we have a problem. Is that the right hello world? Oh, we didn't touch that. Oh, project settings. Yeah, that's a tedious thing. You have to linker tell the linker as well that we have the lib hello to link to and where that is. You see the test code automatically figured that out, the real world code. We have to say it again. Yes, hello world. So everything seems to be fine. For those of you, well, let's 
click through that. That's actually what we did. That is the expected solution to that and a little bit clean up. And what we elaborated with was the Qt unit testing framework. Now what are good test cases? Let me preach a little bit. If you're writing a unit test and haven't done so yet, is you should think about if the code is correct, how would I know? How can I test it? What else can go wrong? Writing good unit tests not only gives you the chance to test your code automatically and make detect mistakes or correct mistakes without breaking other stuff. It also, as a side effect, gives you, tends to give you a much better design of your code. Because to be able to test something, you have to provide clean interfaces so that you actually know what the code or the function you call or the class you use will change during a, a test case. Because then you will have to query it or what will it will compute actually during your test case so you can actually figure out uh, what, what went wrong. And that helps a lot on the code that you're writing it. What you should recognize that as a beginner, like we did with the say hello, we tend to write tests that are the happy path only. I only test the scenarios with valid input and simple cases. That's okay to test these things because it helps us to get things to understand what's going on. But it should also be something where you should actually figure out, okay, can I test, does my code have error conditions? And how can I test them? For example, does it, can it throw an exception? There might be some where you don't care, like out of memory. If you're out of memory in most systems, you have bad luck anyway, so why care? But there are other things where you actually want to care, like, oh, I want to open that file and that doesn't exist, what should I do then? And a bit of terminology, if you write automated tests, they come on different levels. What you would test is the system under test. The system under test can be a single function, it can be a class, it can be a whole subsystem, a library, or even an application if you have to test that from the outside. Not all of these tests have to be automatic, but the more you can automate them, the better you are off in changing anything that's on the right-hand side of that diagram. And change is what is inevitable to your code. To make it simpler, to make it better, to make it work. A typical test case or especially unit tests, comes in four phases where the last one is trivial in C++ because of our AII. You set up something, we set, it, we set up our O string stream to be able to test it. We exercise, we call the say hello function, and we verify, we asserted that the output was there what we expected. And there's the last thing that you have to care about in many other languages, and we learned uh, this week, we shouldn't do that, uh, shouldn't have to care in C++ because we have the curly brace, closing curly brace that cleans up everything for us. And if you write test cases where you have to expl do explicit tear down code, then learn about RAII. How can I recognize if my test cases are good? Test cases are code, and code can be badly written. So there are chances that you might write bad test cases. Good unit tests or good test cases don't have any branches in them. They run linear. McCabe complexity is one. They have the assertions in the end. They test one thing at a time. You don't write unit tests, one unit test per function or one unit test per class? No. You write one unit test per fact you want to test. And that can be plenty of a single, for a single function. If you have to write many test cases for a single function, 
then consider that function might be com too complicated and you want to split it up into several. But it's rarely the case that you only write one single test case for a single function. Even worse, if you write one single test case per single class, that's usually either a very trivial class that might not even need a test case, or it's something that you have put too much code into one function in one test function. Now, how can we get there in good unit tests? One practice is actually writing the test cases before we start out. And that's called often test-driven development. Some call it test-first development. Some people prefer, okay, I have to think about a design while I write the test and so on, so I write the test while I'm coding. That's also okay. It's much harder to design a function for testability if you don't have the test in mind as well. So if you, there's a question, step up to the microphone. Uh, oh, sorry, Pablo? Uh, a question about you're saying no branches in the in a test driver. What if you want to test for like say a range of inputs? Uh, wouldn't wouldn't a loop be a reasonable construct to put in the test driver? Uh, depends if you need to run a range on, and a range can be easily tested without writing a loop because there's a great algorithm called for each. Okay. You see, I got those questions already. <laughs> and with lambdas, it's, it's okay. It's, it's a loop in disguise. But I can stick with my McCabe complexity. And it cannot be wrong. If you have your elements that you want to test about in a vector or array and loop over it with a for each and pass it to the function you want to test, you cannot have a one-off error. You cannot forget one. Much better than a for loop iterating. My for loops are usually one-off the first time I write them. So how do we, we do test-driven development? I learned that Rebecca Versbrock is guilty of inventing the driven things with responsibly, responsibility driven design. So we have test-driven development. It's not about testing at all. It's about writing code that while you're writing happens to become a very well-tested code. And helping the tests, the tests help you to think about the design of the code you're writing. And it comes in a very short uh, cycle. You write a test that fails. You may implement the functionality to make the test pass. And then you refactor your code to make it nice. And that's an important step. You make your code simpler while you're running that cycle. A typical TDD cycle can be in seconds or most of that minutes. Maybe you check in slightly less often, but at least several times an hour if you do it like that on your local Git repository who's not using Git yet, or Mercurial. If you don't have company policies that stop you from using it, use Git, or something very similar. Now, let's see if we can do something in TDD, and I need someone to help me with that. I need a volunteer to help me with the flip chart. Volunteer? Great. Don't throw away your phone. So let, let's create a unit testing project. I, I need you in a second. So do you have a pen? OK. We do all these things that are there. And we start out with a list. A typical TDD cycle, because I forget things that I might have thought about, I wrote down a list. So we want to create a switch, and uh, you cannot see it, but you can see it down there. The first thing is we want to create we want to create a switch class that simulates a light switch on and off. Simple enough, but to make it live, we have to do it simple. So the first step is we want to create the switch and see if it's off. Well, 
No, you don't write a class. You just copy one, three, eight is off. Okay for you? Second step is we want to turn it on, and it should be on. Turn on. Is on, is our check. And the third step is we want to turn it off again and check if it's off. Oh, very nice handwriting. Okay, get rid of that craft. So we create our cute TDD for a switch. Compile it, run it, and we see the re result. Oops, sorry, wrong click. It fails. So I told you we start with the assertion a switch should be off. That's wrong, assert. Now, we have code that doesn't compile. Why doesn't it compile? The local variable switch is missing. We can create that. That's not what I wanted. Come on. Somehow that's a problem. And that's of class switch. I could spell it correctly. Now that switch class is not existing, but we can actually create that on a key press as well. And here it still doesn't compile because the member function is not there. But we can create that as well. And let's see if it compiles now. Oh, we have an error. No, that's the wrong. Oh, I. Uh, yeah, as always. It was a strange decision by the JUnit guys that I forgot about always. That's why our creation of the variable didn't work as intended. Okay, we get another warning. Okay, we want to have uniform in initialization. We can do that as well. Now let's see what our test is doing. It's okay, we're done. Cross out the first line, please. We created a switch object, it is off. Now, what, now we need to refactor. What's, what's bad about that code there? No, that's, that's not the bad thing. Our test is okay. The name of the test is bad. What should it be? Actually, it's initial switch is off. Is that okay? Good. Does it run? Even better. Now we need a new test case, second on our thing. So what's that? We should turn it on and check if it's on. No, wrong key. So turned on switch is on.
So again, we have a missing local variable and it still doesn't what I wanted. I have to go back to my students to make it better. Should work. I'm not sure what I. Okay, let's see if it runs. Okay, we have a failing test case. True, we didn't turn it on. Okay. Oh, problem. Need to create a magnbar function. Turn on. It's okay. Let's see. Compiles and still fails to be on. Now we need to do some design. How can we represent the state that it's on? We can cheat. We just say true. Cheating is okay when you're doing TDD because you easily, okay, the switch is now on, but our other test case fails. So something is wrong now. We have to design something. So what we might need is actually a flag. And that's missing again, so we create it. And it should be bool. And let's say, And to be sure that's initialized, we add an initializer to it. Green, done. Now we need to turn it off. Do I need to continue? Or do you want something more? Huh? Okay, thank you so far. I might need you again. Okay, what have we seen? There are, there's a nice book by uh, Kent Beck on, on TDD. The good thing is it's very thin and it contains a lot of wisdom. It's Java based, but the underlying principles, the patterns in there apply to any kind of TDD, even to C++. One thing is, Isolated tests. Tests should be independent of other tests, especially they shouldn't have lasting side effects. That's very easy to do in C++ again because of RAII. It's harder in other languages where you have to do some cleanup manually. We used a list of test cases so we don't get lost when writing the tests and coding. And we write the test before the production code. We even can generate parts of the production code out of the test using my tooling, but you can do that also manually. We usually start with the assertion first to think about, so that we have to think about how do we know if something is okay? And then after we know what it means it is okay, we can put the rest in. If you start writing the test the other way around, oh, I have to put this on and uh, initialize a flux compensator and do something else, and then I can check if I got time travel, you might have forgotten what you actually wanted to check. So that is what we have seen. You could also get this nice green coloring with the uh, test coverage, but I broke my compiler installation. It doesn't work on my machine right now, but it, it tends to work. What is refactoring? Who is refactoring his code often? Every day. Who has never refactored a piece of code? Confess. Who is using an automatic tool to refactor code? Okay, a few of them. Refactoring is something like you tidy up your room when you have played as a kid. 
Like you tidy up your code once you've played with your code. And it's an ongoing cleaning thing. It's not something you do once in a big step and then you're done. It's something you do like uh, flossing your teeth every day, a couple of times a day, maybe even every, every hour, every minute. And uh, this nice picture is, is not a picture of, of an animal, but a picture of an infrastructure for animals that's very popular in Switzerland. In Switzerland, I lost the ability to look where I walk when I walk a city because there are no dog, dog droppings around. It depends where you come from. There are cities where you actually have to step like that to figure out not to get dirty shoes. In Switzerland, that no longer happens because the Swiss want to have their country tidy. And all dog owners carry around these little bags and clean up after the, the dog made his business. And that's something you should do with your code. Clean up your code whenever you're there. Even clean up the code that you might not have written right now. One thing is remove duplication. Get better understandable code. Some people call that habitable code. And that's something you should do, you must do. It's not only you should, it, in, in standard D's, it would be you shall. Now, for TDD practicing, there are more patterns on how to get there. One thing is, Solve a task one step at a time. It's very annoying if you have a red bar in your, for your code base that lasts for hours. It's very depressing. It's much more joyful to have a green bar and celebrate that. And if that happens every minute, you get very positive feedback in a positive feedback loop and you continue going. You should not ha ha first write like all these tests and then start coding. It's much more, much harder. And it's much harder if it's not a trivial thing like our switch class. I have one experience I'd like to share with you. I, I cannot show it now. I think the time is running out otherwise. At one conference, the ACCU conference in England, there was a workshop on TDD. And I wrote an expression evaluator within, uh, I believe, an hour or 45 or 90 minutes, somewhere in between, that did variables, uh, arithmetic, and was independent of the type. You could parameterize with the type that was test-driven, test-first. It worked, and it was a simple piece of code, and I couldn't have done it by just thinking, I want an expression evaluator. I wrote it one step at a time. And maybe if you want to show me how to do that, I can show that to you offline or in a break or whatever. A starter test, usually write the simplest test that you can think of, like test for something that is not there. Test for an empty list. Test for an empty expression to evaluate. Test for an initial value of an object. And refactor, change it while you grow your code. Sometimes if you, who's practicing pair programming? Who's practicing pair debugging? Who, has never, who is always debugging alone? Really? Poor guys. Pair programming is the best thing to do because then you don't need pair debugging. And if you want, if you're together and discuss a design, it's very easy to discuss it using real code and using test code to show how a thing should behave because then you don't have hand wiving and so on. You can have real code to show how something behaves and discuss that. Or if you want to learn an unfamiliar API, especially as we learned before, libraries that you haven't written but you want to use, the best thing to get confidence in the API in the library is write test cases against it if it doesn't come with them. That helps you to trust your JSON library that you might want to use instead of writing your own. How do I get to a green bar? One thing you have seen doing me is fake it till you make it. It's not fake it forever, but it's okay to not solve the problem yet to make the test succeed. But refactor toward the real solution. If you just fake it, it's a fake and that's not what you want. Triangulate. 
If you solve a problem for one, or if you solve, don't know exactly how to solve something, try several ways to do it and try to, and then refactor to the right solution. If it's too obvious, do it right now. And one good thing I always try is, okay, start small and then grow. A typical test case sequence is, okay, I start with one element or with zero, then I add one, and then I try it with many, and this gives me the means on how to implement it correctly. If I would have started with many, I'm overwhelmed easily by the complexity of implementing these many without having figured out the interface yet that might work. One thing to take home, regardless what you're doing, for every bug report that you want to fix, first automate a test that repeats and replaces the bug. Don't start fixing it without the guarantee that you will recognize whenever you change the code to not introduce that bug again. Who is doing that consciously? For those who are not raising the arms, get to hold on with those who are doing that and learn how to do that from them. Regardless if you practice TDD test, unit testing or not, do this. It's cost effective. And another thing is, you need to do enough breaks. One trick, trick by me is get a water bottle, a bigger one like that than that, and drink while you're coding. It will force you to take breaks. And the best ideas about to improve your design come, come from on the loo, at least for me. Or the shower for others. But I wouldn't, uh, uh, you cannot easily force showering. But the other thing is easy. And if you see that you did something bad, especially in mornings when you come in after a late night, which you shouldn't do, delete. You've got version control. You can cherry pick the, the highlights of your yesterday's solution that just didn't work right. It's OK to delete. And I could do another demo, or I could just skip over several things I didn't want to show you right now. If you're interested in how to get existing code under test, come again next year, then I will be uh, hopefully have the slot to do that for you, to show that for you. And I should give you the chance to ask questions first. And if we have still have time, and I know there's a long break, we can do another exercise using doing an expression evaluator. Questions. By the way, that's our campus whenever you come to Switzerland. Pablo at least knows it. <laughs> and if you want to try all the tooling, CVELOP is the key to do that. Let's come first. Let's come first. So if you're writing a, a test for each fact, and you're saying that each test should finish without last lingering side effects, it seems to me like some tests are going to have bigger and bigger builds, like things you have to set up before you test the actual fact, things that you've done in previous tests, you know they work. But, you know, for example, if you, if you want to test that, that your vector grows successfully from 64 elements to 65 elements, um, you have to insert the 64 elements first. And it seems to me that in certain cases, you um, you could end up with, uh, of course, you know when you run your unit tests, you're still running all of those previous tests, each of which is longer than the one before. It, it seems to me that your run times would actually start getting long uh, for certain for certain classes or or so on that have a lot of tests. How do you deal with that? So let's see. Here we have duplicated code. It's it looks trivial. But we have two lines that are very similar. Let's consider that this not just instantiating a single object, but what you told us about, OK, instantiating and uh, populating a large thing. So what, what I would do then is actually extract the function doing so. Let's see if we can do that automatically. I'll be brave. It cannot extract the declaration only, I believe. <laughs> 
But you could write the, the yeah. you could write the turn off that requires Make that you turn on first. Switch and populate it. Is that what you intend to do? Yes. Okay. We do that, and now we can actually reuse that code down here. Okay, so you're reusing the code, but your run times are still getting kind of a... Well, a, if, if you have something that some. actually takes long, that calls out for actually substituting the slow thing with, with a replacement that is not that slow. So things like a database connection or network I.O. or any I.O., let's say, that can be slow is something you shouldn't test directly in a unit test when you elaborate something, when you test something that works on top of that. I know if you have many, many test cases and the number of elements go into millions and even allocating them is, is too long. But maybe that's the wrong means to test that in a simple unit test where you test the functionality. That should belong in something like a, a performance test, a load test that has different trade-offs so we can actually put up a, se a, a separate thing. But that shouldn't be used for testing, let's say, core functionality. If something works for one, two, and a, a tiny n, it's from, let's say, induction, it might work for larger n's. And you might only write a test for very large n's, not for every n from zero to that very large number. If you really want to elaborate on, on all of the integers that you might get as input, that might be a little bit too much. If your code is so sensitive to that input that tells something about a problem you're doing, and maybe you need another abstraction for that. Does that answer your question? I, I, it, it answers my question, I'm just not sure. Sure, I have to go back over the kind of modules where I had to write these large builds where the setup for, for testing one fact could be 20 lines of code and see if that makes me happy, but I can't say offhand whether that would. <laughs> uh, without the concrete situation, it's hard to, to, to give you a remedy for that. So, but, but you can call me in as a consultant. I do that regularly, code, code reviews and change that. <laughs> Can you use the microphone that everybody can hear what uh, yeah. you're talking uh, about? Gerald Mazaros has a book, X Unit Patterns, that yes. uh, shows I was citing how, from that. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, shows how to create a mock object that stands in as if it had a million items in it, but truly only has six behind the covers. So you, you build up a dummy vector, if you will, that was not really having a million in it. Uh, you substitute that in, and then when you insert that 65th element or whatever it was we're talking about, it says, okay, it isn't really worrying about the other 64 in there, but it's acting as if they existed. So that was exactly the topic mock objects about the slides that I just skipped. But you can find them on my, uh, I Twitter, tweeted the, 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 uh, the URL, you can find them on the download side of, of my slides. More questions? So, I have a homework for you. When you return on Monday to your office, write an automated test case for a piece of code that you work on. That could even, doesn't even need to use the unit testing framework, just do it, try it. With my students, I have to stand on their toes, let's say, two months in the semester, and then, and they're on a working on a project, and then they got to understand how test cases help them to change their code. And for them, it's a great relief. And I think we're close to break time or five minutes. More questions? Do you want to see the code that I created with test first of the evaluation, the expression evaluator? Anybody interested in that? Okay. So let's first start with the tests. You see, I started out an empty string should throw an X. If I want to evaluate an empty thing, I designed in a way, okay, it should throw an, an empty expression. And I throw strings because 
I don't have to invent an expression type of that. If I have something like, okay, open parent, closing parent, that's a syntax error, so I expect that to throw. And the first real test case is, okay, if I pass in a single number, it should evaluate to that number. Not that hard. Addition, five plus five equals 10, okay. I can even multi have multiple adds and so on. And I grew that through these test cases almost in that sequence using parentheses. Again, parentheses, the simple case you see without any operation within the parentheses. Then I used, okay, now I actually have to use a parentheses and even more complicated things with many parentheses. And then I started over and said, okay, I switched from that simple eval function to something where I have multiple expressions with variables. And all that by refactoring the code to put that eval function into an, an, an object, a parser object, and eval there, and to have, for example, assignment to a variable, and then arithmetic on that variable and getting results from that. And First, I started with single character variables, and why not make it longer? That was just a change from having a map of character to the numbers to string to numbers. And resulting expression parser, for those familiar with compilers, is not that hard to do. Evaluating a single operator is a switch statement. Evaluating a stack with, when you have parentheses or something like that. I have function like, okay, has it a higher precedence or is less left associative? Things like that. Where is the main eval loop? The eval calls parse and parse does the typical thing. And all that code was created within an hour plus minus. In this example, uh, what was the ratio of lines of test code to lines of product code? Um, or unit I would say, code. well, if, if you use, count each test with three lines, uh, we can check that di directly here. It's 189 minus 123, that's something 66. 19 by 8. So it's 1 to 1, maybe uh, even 1 to 2. And I confess these test cases aren't that splendid. I could have thought of more. But I, I was, it was sufficient for me to get the design right and, and the parts are working. So. One to one or two times a test case to one times. It depends heavily on the problem. So parsing an expression for me as someone with a back compiler background is, is, is not a big problem. But even then, I got the code much simpler than I would have made it if I would have started out with the overall goal up front. It would have been much more complicated, much more code, and less well tested. Final question, try this at home and huh? uh, at work, yes, whatever you call home. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>